الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين ثم من بعد once again السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, two things that are left out from the discussion on the first ayah سبي حسم ربك الأعلى uh, the first one نزه تسمية ربك وذكرك إياه أن تذكره إلا وأنت خاشع معظم ولذكره محترم The basic meaning of that being Be cognizant of the perfection of the name of your Lord That when you mention him You are not found mentioning him except that you are fearful That you are acknowledging his grandeur uh, And when you do mention him it is in a respectful fashion So it is the attitude with which you remember the name of your Lord It's not just to mention the dhikr itself but it's the attitude with which you have that dhikr that is highlighted by not mentioning ba next to sabbih isma rabbik. Instead of that, Allah did not say sabbih bismi rabbik. Okay? The second is that Allah should only be named because the word ism is used, isma rabbik, al asma allati allaman Allah. Though the names that Allah Himself has taught us, that Allah should be remembered by names that He Himself has taught us. Now, for educational purposes, Sometimes I use the word God because a non-Muslim might be listening, etc. But the educational process is we make the word Allah common knowledge. We make the word Rabb common knowledge. These are the names Allah Azza wa Jal Himself taught us. And they have a beauty in them and a blessing in them and a, uh, an elevation to them, uh, you know, a nobility to them that Allah Himself has given. So we should choose those names to call on Allah, the ones that He Himself uh, chose. So Allah Azza wa Jal says, قُلْ اِدْعُوا اللَّهَ أَوْ اِدْعُوا الرَّحْمَانِ أَيَّمْ مَا تَدْعُوا فَلَهُ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى call him, call him Allah, call him Ar-Rahman, whatever you may call him, know that the best names belong to him. And those are the best names that he himself taught. Now we come to the next ayah, الَّذِي خَلَقَكَ خَلَقَ rather, The one who created. Remember in the previous surah, like we said before, Creation was mentioned, but the creation specifically of the human being. فَلْيَنْظُرِ الْإِنسَانُ مِمَّا خُلِقْ That was mentioned in the previous surah, and it was mentioned in the passive form. What was he created from? مِمَّا خُلِقَ Here Allah mentions the active form, because it begins with the name, so it should be active now. The name should be known, the Lord should be known. The one who created. So the first thing we learn about Allah Azza wa Jal here is His Lordship, رَبُّهُ So رَبِّكَ And then the, the first thing about the Rabb you should know is that He created. Most of humanity, and this is a discourse that will come in other passages in the Qur'an, acknowledge a divine being that created, but refuse to accept that He is their Lord. They have no problem accepting the fact that, a, that someone created them, a higher power they'll call it, or whatever else. right? But they will refuse to make that leap that they are enslaved to that higher power, and they owe that power anything, and that, that power has any rights over them. Allah mentioned the name that, has, that establishes His rights over us first. سَبِّحِ اسْمَ رَبِّكْ First, الْأَعْلَى And then, الَّذِي خَلَقَكَ the, the one who created So his creative power is mentioned. Second, now also, your, your Rabb, he is unlike any other Rabb, like I told you, as Shawkani mentions. There's no other Rabb like he. Why not? No other Lord, no other Master has the power to create. All other Masters have to do, at the most, they have the power to own. They have the power to exact control. But they're not the ones who created anything. Okay? So were they created out of nothing or were they themselves created? All other masters besides Allah are themselves created. So what to speak of them creating anything on their own? But this Lord is unique. الَّذِي خَلَقَ Not only did He create, فَسَوَّى Then after He created, He perfected, He fashioned. He perfected and molded. So تَسْوِيَ literally means to balance and even out. So every creation has been intricately evened out, which was the last thing we talked about before the break. Now another two attributes in verbal form of that same Rabb, of Rabbik al-A'la, two other things that he does, but you know the beginning of the ayah is wa, al-Atf. So it's argued that this Atf is not on al before, but it's actually, uh, or if it is an uh, Atf of al before, that it's connected still to the first ayah. Sabbih isma Rabbik al-A'la alladhi khalaqa fasawwa, at the same time, Sabbih isma Rabbik al-A'la alladhi qaddara fahada. It's, a, it's connected to the first ayah, the second ayah, and also the third ayah in the same way. So declare and acknowledge the perfection of the name of your Lord, the Supreme, the one who now do, does two other things. Qaddara, 
The word qaddara is to calculate something and to plan for something and to thoroughly estimate. I don't even think estimate's not a good word because estimate has the implication of taking a guess, right? But this is really to have an exact plan of action for something and to have precise calculation at hand and ready. Kind of like what we have, for example, when someone engages in a project of architecture, right? They have to plan how wide, how deep, what kind of materials, how long the planks, what material, you know, all of these things have to come into play when they're doing this kind of plan. Now, one who doesn't know what they're doing, they can do guesswork. But the one who has an important project before them, they have to do precise planning. We learn in a few hadith that the planning, all of the taqdeer of the entire creation of the heavens and the earth precedes the actual creation 50,000 years. That Allah Azza wa has already planned all of this before it was executed. And you know, now in, in human effort we know, the more you plan for something and then you do it, the better it comes out. When something is done without planning, it doesn't come out that good. When something is done with a lot of planning, it comes out better, right? So you, what you see is the final product, what you don't see is all the planning that came before. Allah says, الَّذِي qaddara." The previous ayah was about creating, this ayah is about planning and executing and calculating every last minor detail. Fahada. Then thereafter, he guided it. Now what, what does this guidance mean here? A few things. But before we go to the guidance, actually look at, let's look at some classical texts that explain this first part of the ayah. Alladhi qaddara. To plan something well in advance, he says, uh, like uh, for example in Ruh al-Ma'ani we find, Lucy writes, أَيْ أَوْقَعَ تَقْدِيرَهُ فِي أَجْنَاسِ الْأَشْيَاءِ وَأَنْوَاعِهَا وَأَشْخَاصِهَا وَمَقَادِيرِهَا وَصِفَاتِهَا وَأَفْعَالِهَا وَأَجَالِهَا وَغَيْرِ ذَلِكْ مِنْ أَحْوَالِهَا What this means is Allah planned everything out, everything out in its exact nature, what it's going to be like, what its, what its implications are going to be, what are the consequences of this creation going to be, what are the things it's going to be doing, when is it going to come into existence, when is it going to cease to exist, أَجَالِهَا its deadlines, when is it going to cease to exist? And all matters of that creation, meaning everything surrounding creation, not just the creation itself, all of the activities, all of the properties of that creation, all of that was planned in advance. That's covered in the words, الَّذِي qaddara. In another place in the Quran, Allah says, وَكَانَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ قَدْرًا مَقْدُورًا That the, the, the decision of Allah, the matter of Allah, has already been declared in precise calculation. قَدْ جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدْرًا Allah says. That Allah has made a precise calculation for every single thing. Now the thing is specifically, though this is general now, Allah did not add a ka. Like in the previous text we said, الَّذِي خَلَقَ ka فَسَوَّى ka فَعَدَلَ ka. The ka was for the human being. Allah did not put an object here, so it refers to all creation and all calculation of all things, everything in creation. But more than anything else, the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is the human being. Other things apply, but also the human being and his creation and his planning. And of all of them, which human being has been mentioned in this surah first? It is the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa Sabbih isma rabbi ka. The ka referring to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa If you understand this, when we come to the ayat later on, you'll understand the connection between this and why I'm making mention specifically of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa You see, Allah created everything. Then he perfected everything, then he planned for everything, but that plan is useless until you execute that plan, right? So whatever that object is, for example, a person has been planned that he will, he will show up to work at this time, but until you tell that person to do the work, the plan is incomplete. So you have to tell that person what to do now, to everything else is according to plan, that person now needs instruction or guidance. So Allah says, الَّذِي قَدَّرَ فَهَدَى he, he planned it out, he created him perfectly, and then he guided also. What this implies in the case of the Messenger وسلم, is, Allah created him in an intricate fashion. The, the best of the human beings has been created, and he's, it's been planned that he will live in this region, he will live for this many years, he will go through these experiences, he will, he will experience the, the, the sadness of being an orphan and being raised by other than his parents, and he will experience loss and difficulty in his life, and he وسلم, will finally experience coming into contact with, a mess- with, with, a, with the angel, and when the angel comes to him, what does he say? Ma ana I can't read. He told him to read, and he said, I can't read. But was it Allah's plan that he's going to read? Yeah, it was always part of the plan. So Allah created him, perfectly fashioned him, and planned for that day. Though the messenger has no idea this is part of the plan, who still knows already? Allah Azza wa Jal knows. So it was part of the plan that Allah would guide him, fahada. That also applies here, right? So the, the entire career of the messenger, up until the revelation came to him, is also captured in the words, الَّذِي خَلَقَ فَسَوَّى وَالَّذِي قَدَّرَ فَهَدَى It applies to all of creation, of course. 
but primarily here in the context, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because in the beginning we find his mention, at the end, a few ayat later, we'll again find his mention. Now Allah switches from the general, by the way, this guidance I should mention, how does it refer to in the general sense? You know the, the scholars comment, hidayah kawniyah wa hidayah shar'iyah, that there are two kinds of guidance. There's the guidance of creation, that Allah created, for example, the cow and the sheep and insects and birds and whatever else, and the sun and the moon, etc. He created and planned all of them, and then He guided them to do whatever they are created to do. They perform the functions for which they were created for. Another scholar, uh, Rahimahullah, Mufti Muhammad Shafi was commenting on this very eloquently on, on this ayah, and he said, you know, human beings, we go to school and college, or we go to some kind of training to learn certain kinds of skills. What training did the child get when it came out of the womb of its mother that it knows exactly where to go for the milk? And what training did the mother get to produce the milk naturally? Who, create, who guided the body to pr produce that milk? And who guided the, the child? You know, the, the, a baby, a calf, right? When the, a baby cow comes out, how does it know not to eat worms or anything else to eat grass? How does it know? How does it know these things? How does it know how to feed from the mother? It's been taught all of these things, this is part of the guidance. So Allah planned the mechanisms. He designed the food for the child in the chest of the mother. He designed it. He intricately designed it. He planned for it. And it came at the right time, but then He guided the child to drink also, right? This is part of the, the hidayah of Allah in the sense of the, the guidance of existence. This is why in Surah Al-Taha we find, رَبُّنَا الَّذِي أَعْطَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلْقَهُ ثُمَّ هَدَى our Lord is the one who gave everything its existence, who granted everything rather its existence. Thereafter, He guided it. Not only did He create it, He guided it. The, the, these creatures, they know what to do, where to get their, their, their meals, where to produce their homes. So for example, in, in the case of a namla, we find the ant, they know how to produce their home and where to get their rizq and what to do. Allah guided them, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now Allah mentions this creative process, one example of it. وَالَّذِي أَخْرَجَ الْمَرْعَى the next ayah, the one who draws out, extracts, akhraja, ikhraj is to, to extract or to pull out. Al mar'a, mar'a comes from ra'yun or ra'a, the verb ra'a, which is to pasture or to graze or the animals to feed. The ra' is, for example, the the, uh, the the shepherd because he is taking care of the animals of pasture. That's why he's called ra'. Also, the word mar'a means mar'a, which is a zarf makan. It's a place is the place where there's a lot of greenery, the purpose of which is that animals will graze on it. It's perfectly suited for consumption of certain kinds of animals. So Allah is referring to that as an example of His perfectly calculated and planned design. وَالَّذِي أَخْرَجَ الْمَرْعَى You know, in the previous surah, Allah Azza wa Jal spoke about another kind of khuruj. Allah says, يَخْرُجُ مِنْ بَيْنِ الصُّلْبِ وَالتَّرَائِبِ In the previous surah, and you know, the, the, the human being his creation begins from that, that fluid that starts between the sulb and the taraib. You, you remember that? The, the bone in the back and then the, the, the rib cage. Somewhere in between that large you know, expanse, which seems like such limited space, but Allah turns it into a mystery in the previous surah, there's the beginning of the creation of the human being. But here Allah draws life out of the earth. وَالَّذِي أَخْرَجَ الْمَرْعَى You know, the word uh, mar'a, once again for grazing, or the, the pastures that are perfect for grazing. And you know, we know that animals don't just eat any kind of plant, they have to eat certain kinds to be able to survive, they can't digest any, just anything. So Allah designs, you know, you have, for example, children, you have to get food for them, right? But who prepares the meals for the bird, and for these animals that are out there, human be living things, you have to take care of them, right? Somebody has to provide for them shelter, somebody has to provide fo food for them, and the kind of food that they can digest, who's been providing food for these, these creatures since they were created? for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, Allah Azza wa Jal. So he's, he's showing you His intricate design without our planning. You know how, how long we think it takes us to plan to figure out for our food. Every bird leaves its nest in the morning and Allah has a plan for it of where it's going to eat and how it's going to eat. So, وَالَّذِي أَخْرَجَ الْمَرْعَى فَجَعَلَهُ غُثَاءً أَحْوَى About this ayah, there's a, a disagreement in the linguistics of the ayah which plays a role in the interpretation of the surah later on. We'll, I'll share both sides with you, inshaAllah. The majority and also the minority. Then he made it, and the words in Arabic are, then he turned that pasture into, or that, that grazing field into, ghutha and ahwa. The word ghutha comes from ghuthyan, which literally means to be nauseous, or to want to vomit. Ghatha al-wadi, 
When the valley is filled with leaves or dung or waste, other kinds of natural waste, then the Arab says غَثَ الْوَادِي Same word from غُثَى غَثَ السَّيْلُ الْمُرْتَعَى rather, When the torrent or like lots of water comes and draws pasture, all the grass gets you know, torn off the ground and it gets piled up in one place, this is غُثَى So in general meanings, غُثَى is two things. Either something that is put together or compiled together, like a lot of times, I mean, we don't really, we're not in touch with nature as much, but you may have had to clean your gutter or, you know, like the, in, in homes and things like that, where the, all the water gets, the, the leaves get, get rotten and they get piled up together, and you have to clean that muck out. That's ghutha, according to Arabic language. But generally also, ghutha means the piling up of any kinds of plants. So it may not be referring necessarily to rubbish or filth, which is an acceptable usage. It's also when plants are jumbled together or, or grow up in a cluster right next to each other. That's also ghutha. So there's the pasturing fields, there's the open fields that are spread out, but then ghutha would be some parts of greenery that are clustered together. Then the next word, ahwa, the adjective. Ahwa is a superlative adjective. It's af'alu tafdeel. And the word hawahu in Arabic, the, the verb, hawahu means to bring, bring something, bring two things together, which is complementing the word ghutha, but also means of something to become red or black, black and red at the same time, okay? Like very, very dark. And this is in two implications. One, when a kind of veg some kinds of vegetation, when they're fully, fully mature, then they have this texture to them, which is green or red or whatever, but it's overwhelmed by a blackness. That's when they're really, really mature. But another is when they've gone bad, then they turn black. Like if you leave some kind of fruit or any kind of vegetation out, if you put it in your fridge or leave it out in the kitchen after a couple of weeks, what color does it turn into? But also that darkness is, is a sign of two things. One, it's a sign of maturity. The other, it's a sign of going bad. Right? It's a sign of two things. This is where the disagreement comes in. A great number of ulama consider this ayah talking about the, the vegetation that is so wonderful, then being reduced to rubbish, b turning black, turning into crust, and being piled together. Basically trash on the earth. So on the one hand, it's life. On the other hand, it's trash. Right? So Allah is contrasting how he creates and how he destroys the same exact creation. A few weeks ago it was mar'a, and now it is ghutha and ahwa. That's the contrast that he's showing. On the other hand, some ulama comment that no, this is actually showing you the maturity of those plants, how they bunch together and how they reach maturity and fruition. And why I said this impacts the rest of the surah is if this is talking about the best of the plantation and then the worst of it being destroyed, then it's a comparison of this life, uh, the beginning of this life or the joys of this life and how soon they wither away, the temporal nature, the transient nature of this life. That's one parallel. If this is talking about plants being in their early phases and then reaching mature phases, because we find afterwards um, the mention of the Messenger والسلام, him not to worry that the Qur'an will be recited to him and he will not forget, meaning it will reach maturity, perhaps it's alluding to that passage. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Okay? So the very next ayah, سَنُقْرِئُكَ فَلَا tansa. We will make you read. You know, qara'a in Arabic to recite. Aqra'a yuqri'u. This is different from qara'a. This is aqra'a, if'al. To make someone read. Allah says, soon we will make you read. Soon we will make you recite. This is part of the miracle of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa What were the first things he said when the angel came to him? He said, ma ana bi qari. I don't read. But Allah says, I will make you read. Right? Sanuqri'uka. So this ability will not be your own. It will have been given to you from... Allah Azza wa Jalla, soon we will make you read. Now the thing is, what this is referring to then is the surahs that are coming. Because it says sa in the beginning, which means soon. It's alluding to the future. Why is Allah Azza wa Jalla talking about the future? The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is concerned. He's concerned that he might forget the Qur'an that is going to be revealed to him. And he's also concerned maybe he's been able to, according to Allah Azza wa Jalla, He's been able to live up to the demands of revelation thus far. But there's no guarantee he'll be able to live up to those, those demands, that mission that Allah is putting on him. How will he be able to live up to it? How will he be able to remember that overwhelming word? So he's concerned, sallallahu alayhi wa This concern, by the way, occurs in three places in the Qur'an. This is the third of them. The first place we find, Allah says, وَلَا تَعْجَلْ بِالْقُرْآنِ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يُقْضَى إِلَيْكَ وَحْيُهُ وَقُلْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي عِلْمًا don't rush to the Qur'an before its revelation has been mandated for you, before that time has come. This is in Surah Al-Taha. Similarly, in Surah Al-Qiyamah, we find, لَا تُحَرِّكْ بِهِ لِسَانَكَ لِتَعْجَلَ بِهِ Don't rush your tongue to acquire it quickly. Because the Messenger would be concerned, sallallahu alayhi wa that I might forget the Qur'an. 
And understand, we, we talked about this a few times before, but the messenger is very, very aware, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he is carrying in his heart the message of salvation for the rest of humanity for all generations to come. This is not, we talk about an important document, right? And he has this enormous sense of responsibility. One of the things that is nerve-wracking to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is he might forget even a piece of it. And you know, when you're worried about, think of it from the point of view of a student. When you're worried about one part of your studies, you stop worrying about the other part. For example, if you're listening to a lecture from your professor and you're writing everything down, right? When you worry too much about writing, what starts happening? You're not paying close attention. So you wrote it down, but you look back and you say, what was I writing? I have no idea, right? Because you focused on one thing, you lost track of another thing. Allah Azza wa wants His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, His focus not to be on memorizing. Because that will distract Him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from more important things that Allah deems more important. So Allah takes that concern away from Him. He says, Sanuqri'uka, we will make you recite. We will make you recite. You know how the surah began and where it's turned to now? The surah began, declare the perfection. Right? Acknowledge the perfection of your Lord. And many of the ulama commenting on the language of this ayah, say that when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam acknowledges, acknowledges the beauty and the perfection of Allah's names, that in and of itself starts making his burden light. That starts making his burden light. And when he reflects on the creation, Everything has its time. Everything has been created, everything has been thoroughly planned, everything has been given precise calculation, and then it's been guided. You are no exception. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look at the pasture around you. It's been created, it grows for a purpose, and then it reaches its culmination. Just like that, you will also be given this revelation. You have nothing to worry about because this planning is not in your hands, it is in Allah's hands. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sanuqri'uka. We will make you read. We will make you recite. Fala tansa. Then you will not forget. Then you will not forget. So the messenger is concerned, he will forget. Allah says, no, no, no. He's taken the responsibility that he will not forget. You see, the Arabic language grammar is really important for, for students of Qur'an and of deen in general. You know, فَلَا tansa. If this was the, the alif maqsura was not there, that would have been fi'il nahi. Don't forget. Then it would have been forbidding the messenger from forgetting. But it doesn't say فَلَا tansa. It says فَلَا tansa. Like in other places in Qur'an, we, we find وَلَا tansa Short. فَتْحَ Just فَتْحَ وَلَا tansa نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا Don't forget your portion that you're responsible for in dunya also. But here's فَلَا tansa, which is a consolation. If it was فَلَا tansa, it would have been almost a concern for the messenger. The Allah is saying, don't forget. So it's more of a burden on him. But Allah is giving him consolation saying, you won't forget. فَلَا tansa, You will not forget. So Allah has taken that concern from his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And here now we find the istithna mufarraq. إِلَّا مَا شَاءَ الله. The exception. Except for what Allah has himself decided. The word... Sha'a and Arada, I put off the discussion on the difference between the word Sha'a and Arada, but at least Mashiach I told you some things about before when we were discussing the ayah, Wa ma tasha'una illa an Allah. It's concrete decision. If Allah has made a firm decision, what, by using the word Sha'a, Allah has let us know that even if the Messenger وسلم, forgets an ayah, that is not something like a casual intention, and you know when you and I make an intention and I teach you something and I say, no, 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 forget it. Right? That's like a casual, I didn't think it through enough. But has Allah already established that everything is thoroughly planned out in the surah? The context already been explained. So when you come to the ayah, إِلَّا مَا شَاءَ Allah, Except for whatever Allah wills. We will make you recite and you won't forget except for whatever Allah wills. إِلَّا مَا شَاءَ Allah. What does that mean? First of all, because of the context, we know that Allah will make forgotten what was already have been planned to been forgotten. This was part of the plan all along. It's not like, you know, like these people who say inappropriate things about Allah Azza wa Jal. Oh, he decided to change it, he changed his mind about this or that or the other. No, but that would be inappropriate to say about Allah. And where did the surah begin? Don't say or think inappropriate things about Allah. Sabbih isma rabbik al-a'la. It began with that point. And it's perfectly connected here now. Because this is where a lot of people have a problem. They have a problem. What, what is this nasakh? Why did the messenger forget sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? There's a few things here that we should comment about and the benefits of, of, of nasakh, especially of, of nisyan. You know, about, about this ayah, most of the ulama are in agreement that it's not talking about an ayah being forgotten altogether. 
Some of them do have that opinion, and it's a legit opinion, that, you know, Allah says, مَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَةٍ أَوْ نُنْسِهَا نَأْتِ بِخَيْرٍ مِنْهَا أَوْ مِثْلِهَا We don't, you know, cancel out or abrogate an ayah, or make it forgotten, except if you bring something better than it, or just like it, right? And better than it, by, by better than it means, better suited for the people, better for their guidance, what fits them better, what they need the most, Allah knows what we need the most. But for a certain time, there's a certain instruction, it doesn't apply for all times, it applies for that certain time that Allah reveals that ayah. And when the ayah's purpose has been fulfilled, what does he do? He lifts the ayah and he gets it removed from the memory of all the people. This is one opinion about this. That Allah Azza wa knows, Allah يَعْلَمُ مَنْ خَلَقْ Doesn't he know what he created, who he created? He knows us best. So if there's an ayah or some part of revelation that came, whose precise guidelines were necessary for that occasion, and then thereafter, keeping that ayah would have been cause for more harm than good. Allah Azza wa does what? He removes it, then this is how he created. The other thing here is, there are two other benefits. The second is, it's been interpreted differently. It's been interpreted as Allah Azza wa Jal made his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sometimes forget Quran in salah, and the sahaba would remind him, is this ayah been canceled out because you didn't recite it? And he said, no, I forgot. Right, so what does this illustrate? This illustrates that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is in the end a human being. Who is beyond all imperfection in all ways, shapes and form? It is Allah. Sabbih isma rabbika al-a'la. Right? Allah, you know, the messenger of Allah is so high above us, but still nowhere near where? Allah Azza wa there's no comparison, right? Ar-Rabbu Rabbun, the Rabb is always going to be Rabb. So Allah establishes His perfection and His control over His messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa We dare not say anything inappropriate about our messenger, alayhi salatu wa But we need to understand that Allah is our Rabb and also his Rabb sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? He's also his Rabb. So he can, just like he gave you this gift, he will show you his power over this gift. It's not yours, it was been, it's been given to you. He's the one who guided you to it, so he might make you forget. And this is part of, actually part of the, the, uh, the isma of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his innocence and his purity. Because, you know, those who claim to be pure of sin or free of sin, like for example, there are some religions in which a certain priest or, or a certain kind of hierarchy, they're free of sin. So when we say about our Messenger وسلم, he's free of sin. They say, yeah, we have that too. What's the difference between their free of sin and our free of sin? The difference is their free of sin, is never, they never get corrected. How do we know our Messenger is free of fault? Is that if, if something human does happen from him, who corrects him? Allah Azza wa Jal. Right? That in itself is a guarantee that he's on the right path. That Allah corrects him, and we, we talked about this in the ayah, in the ayah, Abasa wa Tawalla. Right? We talked about that in that ayah. This is in of itself a proof that he is the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Innahu ya'lamu al-jahra wa ma yakhfa is placed in the same ayah. And this is actually very important. Because when a subject is placed in the same ayah, Allah says, لِيَلْدَبَّرُوا ayatihi. So they reflect deeply into his ayat. Right? So an ayah is one lesson almost. You could study, you could think of an ayah like one chapter, one study. So when this part is, this text, which literally means, certainly it is he who knows the obvious, the seen, the visible, jahra, wa ma yakhfa, and that which is hidden, or that which hides away, then since it's placed in the same ayah as illa ma sha Allah, except for what Allah wills, meaning the parts that you will forget, that Allah wills, it means the parts of recite, Quran that are recited, and that are in the jahra, he knows those, and that which has been hidden, he knew about them all along also. Now, the, the, a few things about the language of this ayah. Uh, uh, the first thing is the, the word illa. The word illa. Inna al-istithna bima'na al-qilla. One of the meanings of this exception is, is like uh, minuscule. So if you will forget something, those will be minuscule incidents and there will be one or two things and then Allah will make you remember again. Okay? Then they're ma'doom. In other words, it's not a... Permanent forgetfulness, it will come back to you. So this is, don't let that overwhelm you into thinking you're going to forget Qur'an. Those exceptional cases will happen. And this is why we don't find thousands of narrations of the Messenger وسلم, forgetting Qur'an. How many do we find? A handful. Literally a handful. Now the, the, put this in perspective. How many ayat of Qur'an are being revealed? How many surahs in the end of the Qur'an? 114. And not all of them are complete all at once. Bits and pieces of ayat of different surahs are coming, and the Messenger والسلام, knows which ayah goes in which surah, which ayah goes in which surah, which ayah goes in which surah. And some surahs take a dozen years to complete, like Surah Al-Baqarah, takes, takes 12 years literally to complete. 
And in the meantime, all of Madani Qur'an is being revealed. Baqarah is revealed in the beginning of Madi Medina and goes on until the end of Medina. And in the meantime, all of Madani Qur'an is revealed, but the Messenger knows where every ayah goes. So in that context, when you find one narration, that in itself is a miracle that you only find one, two, three, ten, not even ten narrations on the Messenger والسلام, for getting one ayah in salah. Right? This is fulfillment of the ayah, this is a fulfillment. When he forgets, that in itself is a fulfillment of the word of Allah. When he says, إِلَّا مَا شَاءَ اللَّهِ So Allah says, it is he who knows. إِنَّهُ يَعْلَمُ Now the word إِنَّهُ is really important here. If you say, يَعْلَمُ الْجَهْرَ وَمَا يَخْفَى It's correct Arabic. He knows the scene and what is hidden. But he says, إِنَّهُ يَعْلَمُ This is what's called الْإِثْبَاتْ عَلَى غَيْرِ الْفَاعِلِ This is, is, this is Jumla Ismiya, it's a nominal structure. And the word he is mentioned twice. إِنَّهُ يَعْلَمُ The who is, means he, and the ya in ya'lamu also means he. So the English translation would yield, it is in fact he who knows. And by saying that, what it implies is no one else. In other words, the messenger is told, in the end you are learning, but who truly has the knowledge? Who truly has it? It is in fact Allah Azza wa Jal. His superiority, even over his slave Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is illustrated when he says, innahu ya'lamu. Then he says, al-jahra wa ma yakhfa. Whatever is seen. Jahar is an activity that you do that everybody can see. That's jahar. Okay? For example, and by the way, the opposite of jahar is sir. Wa asirru qawlakum awajharu bihi. Right? Make your, make your words secret or make them public so everybody can hear what you said. Awajharu bihi. Similarly, la yuhibbu Allahu al jahra bisu min al qawl illa man zulim. Allah does not want, Allah does not like that you curse somebody or use bad words against somebody except if someone is wronged. But you use them out loud. You know, jahr is used there. But now the opposite here is not إِنَّهُ يَعْلَمُ الْجَهْرَ sirra. Right? He doesn't say that. He says وَمَا يَخْفَى A different kind of wording is used. The opposite wasn't used. Now the benefit in doing this is the word khafiya in Arabic, it means to hide something so well that you don't even know it exists. Sir is a secret. But the guy who doesn't know the secret, at least he knows there's a secret that exists. I don't know what, the, what it is, but I know it exists. It's classified information. I don't have access to it, but at least I know it's there. When you say khafiya, it is so secret that you don't even know it's there. So you, you're not missing anything. Why is that word perfectly appropriate here? Because when the ayah is made forgotten from the messenger, so the, the ones that are permanently made forgotten, will anybody even feel that they were missing? Will that, any human being even get the inclination that something was there, it seems to be missing? Nothing. Because wama yakhfa. The other thing here is that jahr is an ism. Al jahr is an ism. It's a noun. What wama yakhfa is a verb. It's a verb. So why would Allah use the nominal form, the noun form for the manifest, and the verbal form for that which is hidden? First of all, a verb is limited, and a noun is unlimited in some sense. Okay. So by limiting it, meaning the only few things will be made hidden. Only few things will be forgotten. That's one implication of it. It's lesser in degree. Wama yakhfa. The other is nothing remains hidden forever. That Allah Azza wa eventually will expose everything. Right now everything, much is exposed. But Allah will expose everything eventually. So that the attribute of something remaining hidden is not going to last long. وَمَا يَخْفَى is in verbal form because a verb doesn't last forever. It's temporary. وَنُيَسِّرُكَ لِلْيُسْرَى Subhanallah. He will make, and, and then Allah first He gives him this consolation that he will not forget. That you will not forget the Qur'an. Then he tells him, you know, إِلَّا مَا شَاءَ اللَّهِ إِنَّهُ يَعْلَمُ الْجَهْرَ وَمَا يَخْفَى وَنُيَسِّرُكَ And we will make easy for you. In normal Arabic, you say, وَنُيَسِّرُ لَكَ You don't say, نُيَسِّرُكَ We say, نُيَسِّرُ لَكَ You put a lamb there. I made easy for you. Even in English, you don't say, I made easy you. You say, I made easy for you. The, the word for is even there in normal Arabic. Allah took it away. Allah took the lamb away. And this is actually a rhetorical function of Arabic. There are some prepositions, if you mention them, it's obviously what we're expecting them. But when you take them away, the meaning is still clear. The function of taking them away is to bring two words closer. And the word, and this is called taqrib. And when you put the preposition there, you've taken the words and you put them farther apart. Now when you take them farther apart in the language, in the rhetoric of Arabic, that means that this word demands to be farther away from that word. But when you bring them closer together, the concepts are closer, meaning Allah has brought Himself closer to His Messenger out of love, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when He says, وَنُيَسِّرُكَ As opposed to saying, وَنُيَسِّرُ 
laka. He's brought the dimension of the messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, closer to the verb that was used for him himself, the fi'il yassiru. So this is part of the ijaz of the Quran, the beauty of the Quran, and part of the love. It's an expression of the love Allah shows His Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. What's interesting about this ayah, if you look at one yassiruka, we will make easy for you. Now, what will he make easy for him? Now, if I say for you, to you, for example, I'll make something easy for you. You would think, okay, the something was originally hard, and now you're going to make it easy for me. Allah says, wa yassiruka lil yusra. I will make ease for you to get eventually to the ultimate ease. Yusra is the superlative form and the feminine form of aysar. Like, you know, ahsan, husna, akbar, kubra, aysar, yusra. That's the feminine form of the, the superlative, the af'al al-tafdeel. And so Allah tells him he will make the path easy, but the conclusion itself to get to that which is even easier, to that which is the easiest. So what does this, all of this mean? First of all, it means Allah has guaranteed in the part Nuyasiruka that the struggles of the Messenger will be made miraculously easy for him by Allah's intervention. Just like Allah will take Allah took that task of the Quran, right? He took that task of the Quran, which the Messenger thought was going to be difficult to remember. What did he do for him? He'll make him recite, he won't forget. So he says, Walaqad yassarna al-Quran al-dhikr. We made Quran easy for remembrance. He responded to that problem. He took it away from the Messenger. The second is his struggle in the world. The da'wah he has to give, the message he has to give to the people. How is he going to deliver this message? It's a tough thing. Allah Azza wa guarantees him, He will make ease for him. When we look at the struggle of the Messenger, والسلام, we see one of the, uh, probably the most difficult struggle ever waged in human history. But when you look at this relationship between Allah and His Messenger, what is Allah calling it? Easy. He is making it easy upon his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is putting tawakkul in the messenger alayhi salatu wa sallam. That no matter how tough things get, what ayah does he have to rely on? What is his anchor? What is his refuge? وَنُوا يَسِّرُكَ لِلْيُسْرَ Now look at the words لِلْيُسْرَ In a hadith we find some of Asirun have, have put this, placed this hadith, which is sahih, under this ayah as an explanation. بُعِثْتُ بِالْحَنِيفِيَةِ السَّمْحَةِ السَّهْلَ That I was sent with meaning the legacy of Ibrahim Alayhi Hanifiya, sole dedication to Allah, that has in it lots of relaxation, lots of allowance, and it's very easy. In other words, the Sharia of Islam, the, the regulations you will be delivered, the commandments you will be given, will not be difficult, they will be easy. But Allah doesn't just say, فَنُوا يَسِّرُكَ لِلْيَسِيرِ He says, يُسْرَى, easier. Meaning, however you live life now, when you live by Sharia, life doesn't get harder, life gets easier. SubhanAllah. Allah says, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ أَنْ يُخَفِّفَ عَنْكُمْ وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضَعِيفًا Surah An-Nisa He says, Allah intends to lighten your burden. When a person starts following the ahkam of Allah, you know what they start feeling like? Life is getting harder. Man, this is haram, that's haram, gotta do this, gotta do that, right? They start feeling like life is getting harder. What is Allah saying instead? Allah intends to make life lighter on you, to, make, to ease your burden. And the human being was created weak. The human being doesn't realize that which make life, will make life easier, he thinks it will make life difficult, and this is part of the difficulty. He doesn't understand the wisdom in things. We may not understand the wisdom in the sharia, but it's there to make life easy for us. So the Messenger is told, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he will facilitate for him the ease. وَقِيلَ الْمُرَادِ بِالْيُسْرَى الطَّرِيقَةَ الَّتِي الطَّرِيقَةَ الَّتِي هِيَ أَيْسَرْ وَأَسْهَلْ فِي حِفْظُ الْوَحِي Number one. Well, Ashokani mentions that the meaning of al yusra here is the path by which the memorization of the revelation will become easier than it has ever been before. Waqila hiya sharia al hanifiya as sahla. It's also been said that this aysa, the easier, is referring to the sharia, the laws that will come that will make life easy and they will bring bring comfort to people. You know, peop, when, when Allah Azza wa Jal intends to guide someone, woman yuridillahu an yahdiyahu, when Allah intends to guide someone, yashrah sadrahu lil Islam. He opens his chest for Islam, meaning he, the, Islam means submission, right? When you submit to Allah's commandments, you will find relaxation. And if you find relaxation, that means Allah has intended for you that you should be guided. On the other hand, if you are from the unfortunate, who when they obey Allah, what do they feel? Discomfort. يَجْعَلْ صَدْرَهُ حَرَجًا ضَيِّقًا حَرَجًا You know, their chest becomes tight. كَأَنَّمَا يَصَعَّدُ فِي السَّمَاءِ Like he's climbing up into the sky. He's losing his breath that this is actually part of a curse, a rijz, عَلَى الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ on those who don't believe. So this, this is part of the attitude we're supposed to have. And notice, this surah, one of its core lessons is a change in attitude, right? 
from the very beginning, what attitude, what is the attitude with which you remember Allah and how you think of Allah and how you respond to things that are said about Allah. That was captured in Sabbi Hisma Rabbika Ala. Then the attitude of the Messenger, his concerns being removed. Then his attitude about the coming revelations, he's thinking they're going to be difficult. What does Allah tell him? They're going to be easy. And the way to them is also easy. SubhanAllah. How, t- how much time till Aisha, by the way? 42? No, Iqama. 10 o'clock? Okay. Alright, فَذَكِّرْ fa. fa here is basically a conclusion. Therefore, fa. then, after you've heard this, your concerns have been removed. The Qur'an will be given to you, you will not forget. And on top of that, your, your apparent problems and your hidden, he knows them. And on top of that, he will facilitate your way for you. Now that all of your distractions have been taken away, you need to get back to the task, the mission. What is the mission for the Messenger Sallallahu Fadakir. Fadakir. This will come up again in the next surah. Fadakir. Innama anta mudakir. Lasta alayhim bi musaytir. But here, Fadakir. Remind then. Then, remind. You know the word, Dhakir, usually you, you expect some sort of a, um, an object after it. Dhakir ni, remind me. Dhakir hu, remind him. Dhakir in nas, remind the people. No object has been mentioned. In other words, the messenger is told, no matter where you are, no matter what situation you find yourself, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, just con- continuously engage in the act of reminding. This is your mission. This is the second commandment. This is the second imperative verb used in this surah. The first was sabbih. Sabbih isma rabbika la'ala. That was the first one. This is the second one. Fa. Dhakir. And in these two, there is a summary of the entire life of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he is not reminding the people, what is he doing? Tasbih of Allah. Either he's standing in the middle of the night, declaring his Lord's perfection in Salah, or in the daytime, Inna laka fin nahari sabhan tawila. Right? He's out in the daytime, delivering the reminder to the people, the tough job that Allah has given him. Both of them. Both of them are here, subhanAllah. Now, فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّ فَعَتِ الذِّكْرَى إِنَّ فَعَتِ الذِّكْرَى This is a conditional statement. It's called in Arabic, jumla shartiyya. Here, the meaning, literally, the literal meaning is then remind if reminder served to have benefit. إِنَّ فَعَتِ الذِّكْرَى The word nafa'at is in fi'il madhi. It's in the past tense. إِنْ تَنْفَعِ الذِّكْرَى If it was in the present tense, then it would be maybe it'll have benefit. In nafa'at al-dhikra, it actually is a rhetorical statement. You know how you say to somebody, if you're a real man, you're going to go. Right? What you're trying to say is go. It's a challenge to you. Right? Same way Allah says to His Messenger, وسلم, remind if reminder will have any benefit. Does the Messenger already know, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that reminder will have benefit? Yeah, he, he knows. He's been taught all along that he should be. Reminding, وَذَكِّرْ بِالْقُرْآنِ مَنْ يَخَافُ وَعِيدٍ Remind with the Qur'an, whoever fears my promise. One implication of this is for sure remind. Because certainly there is benefit in reminder. Another implication of this is, maybe reminder will have benefit. Perhaps reminder will have benefit. Who's the only one who knows if reminder has benefit or not? Only Allah. إِنَّهُ يَعْلَمُ الْجَهْرَ وَمَا يَخْفَى He knows the, the obvious, he knows the unseen. When you try to remind someone and they repel what you said, I don't want to hear it. You don't know, maybe it got stuck in their head and they processed it a month from then. It happens sometimes. They don't listen to you right away, but they listen to you when they're gone. Maybe they didn't want you to know that they took effect from what you said, but it really affected them. Their ego wouldn't allow for them to show that they're actually listening. Right? But when they were on their own, they listened. So did the reminder still have ended up having benefit anyway? So the messenger is told, فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّ نَفَعَتِ الذِّكْرَى And this is actually our attitude towards people. We don't judge people. We remind. Sometimes you know you're with your cousins, with your family, with your friends. Maybe I should remind them. Maybe I should say something. Maybe I should say something about the kind of language they're using. Maybe I should say something about the, how they're wasting their time. Maybe I should say something about where they're not, they should be putting their eyes where they shouldn't be putting their eyes. Maybe I should remind them. And you say, nah, they're not going to listen. They're not that religious. You know, they're not the type. They're not the masjid type. So I shouldn't probably remind them. Right? It'll probably sour our relationship. Allah says, regardless, don't think in your head who you should be reminding and who you shouldn't be reminding because Allah has not given you the license to see what's inside anybody's heart. And this reminder can benefit anyone. Anyone. So much so that as hopeless as the case of Fir'aun is, does he still, does he still get sent a reminder? Allah still sends him a reminder. 
even though he's Fir'aun, the guy is a genocidal maniac. But still, no, no judgment is passed on him until he makes the decision himself. So anyway, فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّ فَعَتِ الذِّكْرَى The word dhikra is an interesting noun in the Arabic language. It is argued that it comes from ذَكَرَ يَذْكُرُ ذِكْرٌ or ذِكْرًا that it's the, the hyperbolized or the mubalagha form of dhikr, powerful reminder then, that the powerful reminder will benefit. In other words, when you deliver a reminder, it should be powerful, it shouldn't be weak. You should find good words, you should find strong words, you should find words that will appeal to that particular audience. So you should be careful in how you deliver a reminder to people. This is one thing. But the other thing linguistically, according to Lisan al-Arab, the word dhikra is interesting because it, 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 could, be, it could serve as an alternative mustar for three words. Dhakara, Tadhakkara and dhakkara, which is very powerful. Three different words that come from dhikr, and this could be a word that it, it carries the meanings of all of them. Now, what, how does that benefit us? This, if it, me, if it comes from dhakara, then it means that just mentioning itself can have benefit. Dhakara means to, remi- to remember, also to mention. Okay? So mentioning itself has benefit. Whoever benefits from it or not, you yourself will benefit when you mention Allah's name. This is the first thing. Tadhakkara. To make an effort to remember, that includes in it, it's included in it too. When you make an effort to remember Allah, no matter how far you get as far as the results, still benefit has come to you. This is the second meaning. The third meaning is it's from tadkir, dhakkara, tadkir. That reminding others, that activity in and of itself, regardless of whether you see the results on the outside or not, it will still carry benefit. All of these lessons are captured inside the words, al-dhikra. This is told to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he was very, he used to get very upset Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when people didn't listen to the clear message. فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِعُ النَّفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ إِنْ لَمْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَذِ الْحَدِيثِ يَسَفَةً You're going to kill yourself over grief if they don't believe in this, in, this, in this beautiful speech, in this clear speech. Are you going to kill yourself over grief? So Allah says, no, don't worry about anything else. The only job you have to do is what? Remind. فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّ فَعَتِ الذِّكْرَى then سَيَذَّكَّرُ مَنْ يَخْشَى يَذَّكَّرُ from تَذَكُّر Soon, very soon, the one who, who will make an effort to remember تَذَكَّرَ to make an effort to remember تَفَعُل includes an effort in it, right? So, the one who fears will make an effort to remember. Now you see the word man here? Allah does not say سَيَذَّكَّرُ الَّذِي يَخْشَى He didn't say الَّذِي, He said man. And commonly in English, we don't really see the difference between the two. So I want to highlight that here. The word man could be anyone. Anyone who has fear in them, and khashiyah came up a few surahs before, I believe even in Surah Abasa and even in Nazi'at. The word khashiyah means to fear something greater than yourself. Or fear something that, that has power to overcome you. Okay, that's what khashiyah is. Allah says, whoever has that khashiyah, whoever will have that, that, that fear, even for a little while, will make an effort then to remember. They will make an effort to remember. مَنْ يَخْشَى So the messenger is told to remind. Now is the reminder scary oftentimes? Yes. The one who is scared will make an effort to remember for themselves. They will exercise their memory and remember. And by the way, what will they remember? What will they remember? The ayat that are being recited to them. Because the messenger is told remind. Remind with what? ذَكِّرْ بِالْقُرْآنِ Remind with the Quran. So if one gets scared about their destiny, they start remembering. And what do they make an effort to remember? The word of Allah. That is the dhikr that's being talked about here. إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ So the word, if الَّذِي was used, Allah would have been talking about somebody in particular. But if man is being used, the scope is open. Anybody who has any fear can still make their way back and can still make an effort to remember. سَيَذَّكَّرُ مَنْ يَخْشَى وَيَتَجَنَّبُهَا الْأَشْقَى and who will make an effort to run away and to avoid at all costs the remembrance? The ha here refers to dhikra, right? And the, the ashqa, al ashqa. Uh, ashqa comes from shaqiya, shaqawatan, to be unfortunate. Shaqi is the opposite of or the antonym of the lid of Sa'id. Sa'id is happy or fortunate. Shaqi is someone unfortunate, meaning someone who doesn't have the fortune of good things, good speech, good advice, good counsel, good company. The, the guy doesn't have go- anything good. This is called shaqi. Ashqa, the most unlucky, the most unfortunate, who doesn't have any, the, you know, any good things in his life whatsoever, mostly refers to good advice and good counsel. So Allah says this most unfortunate person who surrounds himself with evil company, an evil reminder, an evil discourse, right, wasting his life away, 
this person will make all efforts to avoid this message. Tajannub comes from jam. Jam means side. Tajannub means to avoid even touching your side, to distance yourself from something and to keep far away. So this person will make all efforts to distance himself from this reminder. This is the most unfortunate person of all. He thinks the people that take the remembrance are unfortunate, but the reality Allah describes, he is the most unfortunate. He is the most unfortunate. And what will make him what will make it clear that he's the most unfortunate? Alladhi yaslan nar al kubra. By the way, in the language, we had yadhakkaru and yatajannabu from the same pattern, tafa'ul. One is making the effort to remember, the other is making the effort to what? Run away from the remembrance, right? Now this most unfortunate person, this ashqa, this was part of his plan. Just like in the previous surah, innahum yakiduna. Okay, they're making a plan. What was his plan? To stay away from this reminder at a personal level. He wanted to stay away. Now Allah says, what makes him so unfortunate? الَّذِي يَصْلَ النَّارَ الْكُبْرَى The one who will enter the fire, the, the great fire. And we talked about the word yasla not being passive. It doesn't mean he will be entered into or he will be cast into. When you see he will be cast into prison, it feels like some guard threw him in, right? Yasla means he'll throw himself in. He'll go himself. His limbs will rebel against him. His hands, his legs, his feet, they'll all rebel against him. They'll go back to the slavery of Allah and he'll cast himself into the fire. He himself, subhanAllah, الَّذِي يَصْلَ النَّارَ الْكُبْرَى And this, you know, in the previous surah, Allah said, وَأَكِيدُ kayda." I'm making a plan too. He made his plan to stay away. Allah made his plan to cast him into the hellfire. He himself, having himself thrown in the hellfire, may Allah protect us from the fire. This surah is, in, in its literary form, one of its beauties is that the superlative is used often. We found the words a'la, ahwa, yusra, ashqa, kubra, coming up, dunya, khair, then awla, wal akhiratu khairu, wa abqa, abqa also, right? Ula also, the first. All these superlative adjectives are used all through the surah. So the most unfortunate gets the biggest fire. Annar al kubra, right? The superlative form of the fire is used too, subhanAllah. ثُمَّ لَا يَمُوتُ فِيهَا وَلَا يَحْيَا Thereafter, now he's thrown into the fire, then what will happen? What, what makes him so unfortunate even on top of that? Here's another reason. لا يموت فيها, he will not die in it. وَلَا يَحْيَا Nor will he live in it. He will not die in it, he will not live in it. You know, of course, in this surah, Allah did not mention the name Jahannam or Jahim or Sa'id. He mentioned Nar itself, fire itself. In other words, what punishment is Allah highlighting here specifically? Burning. Of the many punishments in fire, in the hellfire, the one that Allah is specifically highlighting here is burning itself. You ever see somebody get burned? Or heard about somebody get burned? And even if you imagine somebody getting burned, what's the biggest thing on their mind? What's the only thing on their mind? Get it off. Get it, finish it. And if, the, if you can't get the fire out, what's the only thing they want then? What are they begging for? They're begging for death. They can't stand it. They can't stand the pain of burning. Now imagine, Allah has put this person in the fire. وَيَأْتِيهِ الْمَوْتُ مِنْ كُلِّ مَكَانٍ وَمَا هُوَ بِمَيِّتِ Death will come to him from every direction. He has every reason to die, but he will never ever die. وَمَا هُوَ بِمَيِّتِ He will never die. But would you call that life? Would you call burning like that life? SubhanAllah. لَا يَمُوتُ فِيهَا وَلَا يَحْيَا This person will beg for death. Remember, فَسَوْفَ يَدْعُوْ ثُبُورًا as soon as he sees hell, he says, oh, just give me death now. I, he hasn't even been thrown in yet. And he says, just kill me now. I don't want to go in. That's what he says. But now Allah says, no. لا يموت فيها ولا يحيا اللهم لا تجعلنا من أصحاب النار. So, you know, the, the, so the fire itself is worse. I mean, we touch a little bit of fire, we pull our finger back. This person is in it forever. لا يموت فيها ولا يحيا And Allah does not give him release with death. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ تَزَكَّى You know, so far the surahs have the surah has not been talking about paradise or no good. We, previous surahs we saw some good news. So far, no good news, right? Just the one who fears takes benefit of reminder, but the one who doesn't is thrown into this kind of fire. Now Allah speaks about the successful. Now you're ready to hear the alternative. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ تَزَكَّى Like Allah says in Surah Al-Mu'minun, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Right? قَدْ أَفْلَحَ the one Someone has already attained success. Aflaha comes from the word iflah, which comes from the farmer, fallah. Fallah. You know, Arabs were really obsessed with farming. Why? Because most of the Arabian region was desert. Very few places have what? Farm. So whatever few regions have farm, they would have lots of words for it because this was something very important to them. Fallah is someone at the 
end part of the year when he's harvesting, when he's getting the fruit of his labor, he's called Fallah. This is the happiest time in the life of a, or the year of a farmer. When he's putting the seed in, the Arabic word for that is kafir. Okay, he's burying the seed, he's called kafir. Not the disbeliever kafir, this is the original meaning of the word kafir. Okay, before Islam. So, at that time he's nervous. I don't know if it's going to be a good season or not. I don't know if it's going to rain or not. I don't know if it's going to get an, you know, some sort of infestation or not in the fields. But at the end, if everything goes through and it's time for harvest season, in any agricultural cu culture, there are lots of festivals and you know, celebrations and things like that because this is an amazing occasion, right? Now Allah Azza wa Jal speaks about the, the this is why from this we get the word muflih, the successful. In other words, this is not a kind of success that you just enjoy. There's a long, perilous turmoil and labor behind it before you get to harvest, right? So when Allah says, qad aflaha, the one who succeeded, it's not just he succeeded, what's highlighted is there's a lot of work that went into that success. Just like that farmer, a lot of work went in before you got to crop season, before you got to harvest. So qad aflaha. The, whoever Allah is about to speak of, because he says qad, it does two things. There's no doubt about it, number one. And number two, this has already the case. The person who Allah is describing in this ayah has already attained success. Qad aflaha. Man tazakka. Whoever engages in the act of trying to cleanse themselves within. Whoever has the time and the effort to look inside themselves and say, how can I make myself a better person? How can I cleanse myself up? Is there anything good left inside of me that I can nourish? You remember these, and the word man is open to anybody. Whoever engages in this act. And we will find as the surah continues, what will keep you from doing this? The bottom line of the surah, look inside yourself. Find something good inside of you. Find what is good inside of you and harvest it and, and let it come out. And the person who becomes con concerned with cleaning themselves, they have already attained the ultimate success because now they have the right concern. They have the right attitude. Remember the surah is about attitude, right? They have the right concern. They have the right priority. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ تَزَكَّى this, The scope is so open of this, the word tazakka, that even Musa offers Fir'aun like we said, هَلْ لَكَ إِلَىٰ أَنْ تَزَكَّى would you consider looking into yourself and cleansing yourself? I'll make you a deal. You do that. I'll guide you to your Lord and you'll develop fear. Fear's already been mentioned here too. Even in Surah Al-Mu'minun, when Allah says, Qad aflaha al-mu'minun, there's salah, there's mention of salah, and then cleansing yourself. Here, iflah, success is mentioned, then tazkiyah is also, or tazakki is also mentioned. What isn't mentioned is salah, so that's coming up in the next ayah. وَذَكَرَ اسْمَ رَبِّهِ فَصَلَّى Just like in Surah Al-Mu'minun, الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ Here it comes up again, because tazkiyah is mentioned. So now let's see, the one who attained success, what were the things that he did? First, he tried to find cleansing, he tried to cleanse himself from within. To help himself, to help cleanse himself, what are the processes he engaged in? وَذَكَرَ اسْمَ رَبِّهِ He remembered the name of his Lord. He mentioned the name of his Lord. Now Allah didn't say Isma Allah, He said Isma Rabbihi. When he remembered that his name, he acknowledged that that is not just anyone's name. He's not just the creator, not just the wise. The wise one, the creator, the knowledgeable one happens to be my master. And I happen to be his slave. And if he is my master and I'm his slave, I better do, I better act like a slave. What is the first act of a slave, practical act of a slave? The very next words, Fasalla. Then as a result, he made Salah. Then he prayed. Then he prayed. And this is an interesting nuance and play on words. By the way, the beginning was Sabbih isma rabbik, and here, Wadakar uh, asma rabbihi. For everybody else. For the messenger, a higher thing. Be conscious of the perfection of the name of your Lord, the Supreme. And for anyone, the beginning point. Just mention the name of your Lord, and the first thing that will be a consequence of that naturally will be you will want to connect to that Lord by means of Salah. Salah. Okay? Now, the play on words here is really awesome. Because you know, uh, when Allah Azza wa says, Yasla, Yasla nar al kubra, the root for Yasla is Saad, Lam, and Wow. Saad, Lam, and Wow. Okay? But uh, the, the root words for Salat are Saad, actually, no, sorry. The root words for sal, uh, Yasla nar is Saad, Lam, and Ya. And the root words for Salat are Saad, Lam, and Wow. They're very close to each other. But one of them is entering the hellfire, one of them is being saved and getting the ultimate success. So the contrast is, the one who attains the ultimate success, what's the final practical manifestation of it? Salah. 
One final nuance of this word here, Allah said, إِنَّهُ يَعْلَمُ الْجَهْرَ وَمَا يَخْفَى Right? So it applies to our salah. He knows the outside of our salah and what is also hiding inside the salah. We're standing in one row all together. Everybody made wudu. Everybody's praying in the right direction. Everybody's making sajda in the same direction. Everybody's listening to the same qira'ah. But one person is thinking about what's home for dinner. And the other person is thinking, what did I leave halfway at work? And the other person is thinking, why, why is this guy next to me, you know, a little bit behind or a little bit ahead? And the one person is remembering Allah. One person is actually remembering the name of his Lord and actually engaged and connected with Allah. They've left the world around them. They've completely connected themselves to Allah. May Allah give us that khushu in our salawat. Then Allah tells us what, what keeps humanity from finding this right priority of success. You know, in the end, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ, right? He attained success. If you ask any human being, what are they running after? Success. A student is running after success by graduating. A candidate is running for success by getting the job. A business owner running for success by expanding the business or making it you know, profitable. Everybody is running after success. We've defined something as success. So how come when Allah has explained this, people are dis- distracted from this ultimate success? What are they running after? Allah explains, بَلْ تُؤْثِرُونَ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا Rather, or on the contrary, all of you, you see there's iltifat here. There was third person. He mentioned the name of his Lord. He, his Lord. Right? Third person. And he prayed. Salla. He didn't say salaita. He didn't say you prayed. He said he prayed. But all of a sudden there's iltifat and a transition to the second person. Because when you think of someone in the third person, you're thinking abstract. I'm thinking about this one person who, who mentioned their Lord and they prayed. You're not thinking about who? Yourself. Allah Azza wa Jal makes you realize when He's giving you these lessons, who do they apply to? Don't think of someone else, think of yourself. بَلْ تُؤْثِرُونَ He doesn't even say, بَلِ nas يُؤْثِرُونَ People prefer worldly life. No, no, no. He said, you, you have given preference. You have compared two things and you've decided one is more valuable to you. This is athara, by the way. To, give, to compare two things and decide one is more valuable to you than the other and you give it more time and preference and priority. تُؤْثِرُونَ الْحَيَاةَ dunya. The word dunya is the feminine form of the word adna, which means closer, also means inferior. Allah calls this worldly life closer to you, you get things right away, and He also calls it inferior. The word dunya captures both of those things. You prefer this life, you prefer worldly life, you prefer closer life. Why? Because the things you think success are, they're right here. They're available right to you. The thing Allah calls success, like jannah, right? being saved from hellfire, is that something near or far in our point of view? It seems far. So Allah says, إِنَّهُمْ يَرَوْنَهُ بَعِيدًا وَنَرَاهُ قَرِيبًا They see it very far away, but we see it very close. But the human being, he, he sees the house in Jannah very far, but the house he can get using a haram transaction very close. Right? He sees the drinks of paradise. وَمِزَاجُهُ مِن تَسْنِيمِ عَيْنًا يَشْرَبُ بِهَا الْمُقَرَّبُ Oh, that will come when it comes. It's there, yeah, I believe that too. But the haram drink that's being offered here is right now. Right? Hurun Ain, yeah, it's there, we believe. But then the haram on the internet and the haram on the television and the haram going down the street or hanging out at the mall or in the hallway in high school or at work, that's here right now. A pleasure for my eyes right now. So Allah offers something far in our view and our pleasures are right here in front of us. Immediate, immediate, right? So we take preference of this close, closer uh, life. وَالْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ وَأَبْقَى SubhanAllah And the hereafter is two things. Better and far more lasting. Better and more lasting. By the, the, both of these words are comparative in nature. Why are the comparative words used? Because the previous ayah, did we engage in a comparison? تُؤْثِرُونَ تُؤْثِرُونَ gives comparison. You give preference to one over the other, so Allah gives His comparison now. وَالْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ وَأَبْقَى Here, uh, Mufti Muhammad Shafi gave an interesting example. I'll give it to you because I think it helps you internalize this lesson very, very beautifully. You know, if, imagine you were given two options. One, you can live in a house, small house, not furnished, not in the best neighborhood, whatever. It's a small house. But you own it. It's yours. Or, you're given the option to stay in a five-star hotel for two days. You're either given ownership of a house, or you can stay in a hotel. Really nice one. What would any smart person pick? Either a home forever or a hotel for two days. Even though the home's not that impressive. What would you pick? 
you kicked a home. That's what any sane person would do. In some sense, Akhira is like that. We don't, since we don't see it, we think it's kind of inferior. I don't know what's going to be there. I know what, internal, what, what furniture I want from my house right now and what the interior decor should look like. I don't know about Jannah if they have IKEA or not over there or, you know, if we can go to, if they have any websites where you can pick the furniture and match or whatever. But I know about that, about here right now. So we, we think of Jannah as, yeah, it's there, but I'm not so sure what's going to happen out there, right? But it's forever. And what do we have here? Forever? They tell you you own the home forever, but you don't own yourself forever. <laughs> right? We're going to be, I mean, they, they, you, a person gets immigration in the United States. They get a green card. They're a permanent resident. Are they really a permanent resident? <laughs> Nobody here is a permanent resident. We're all temporary. We're all going to be gone. The only thing permanent about this is the only fixed thing is death. That's the only fixture. So Allah Azza wa says, well, akhiratu khayr. First of all, it's not even a house. It's better. Any house you can have here, that house is going to be better. And on top of that, it'll be everlasting. It'll be more lasting. In both ways, it's better. So Allah gives you two, two comparisons that convince you of the, the, the better nature of the akhirah. Last parable before we can conclude, inshallah, and, and look at the last two ayat of the surah. You know, human beings, we have this innate nature in us to want to get things right away. And to not want to wait. This is the nature of human beings. If you're in business and somebody offers you a, you know, a product right now to sell right now at a cheap price, like if you sell something for $100, the customer says, I'll give you 95 cash. Another customer says, I'll give you 100 but two months from now. What are you going to do? You're going to sell for 95 You want the cash now. You need the money now. Similarly, Allah offers us Jannah, but when? Later. No brochures, no pictures, right? No websites you can visit to get a view of the property, nothing. You know, he just tells you it's in a good neighborhood. You'll have good neighbors. You'll have a nice yard. It's a waterfront property, pretty large rooms, right? He tells you all this stuff. And you get to stay forever, no property tax, none of this stuff. He tells you all this stuff, but do you get to see any of it? No. Now, any human being, when they want to buy something big, don't they want to see it first? Especially if it's of a heavy price? Is a lot, what, what price is he asking from us? Everything, our life, ourselves, right? It begins with remembering Allah, then engaging in salah, but it's really your entire life that Allah is asking for, right? It's not, so, it's not a small price, but He's asking you and I to believe. He's not going to show you anything. The only thing you have from Him, the one who's selling this to you, by the way, the sales analogy is used in the Quran, right? The one selling it to you, the only thing He's giving you is His word. That's it. Any other sale, if the guy says, man, I'll get you the house, Right? Pay me now, but you'll have the house in 20 years. Where's the house? I'm not going to tell you. Can I see it? No. You got my word. Would you take something like that? Would you take a deal like that? No. You'd call it a scam. And if you bought it, your family, you'd come home to your family and say, guess what? I bought this house. We can move in in 20 years. Where is it? He's going to send me the address. But I paid him all our savings. What's your family going to say? You're crazy. What's wrong with you? But the believer, when he gives things for the sake of Allah, when he gives his life, his wealth, his, his assets, his career, his, his efforts for the sake of Allah, and he goes to his family and he says, you know, I'm giving this for Allah. And Jannah is guaranteed, guess what his family says? Are you crazy? What are you talking about? <laughs> what about the home here? You're, you've gone nuts. So the hypocrites would say to the believers, who were sometimes their own family, they would say to him, as sufaha these fools, these idiots. Look at these people. What are they running after? It's a matter of perspective. Allah wants here, you know, this is why Allah, you know, the Messenger of Allah called this deen strange. We believe in some. it begins with believing in something you can't see. Allah is promising you all this stuff, but you can't see it. You got to believe it. That's what the test of faith is, right? So where does your iman in the akhirah get tested? In the preference. What gets your time? What gets your effort? What gets your attention? What are you into in your free time? Where does your day go? Right? You, don't, you can say, you and I can say, we prefer Allah, we prefer this deen. You know, we, we live for the sake of Allah. Inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. We can say that till we're blue in the face. But, if our actual preferences are headed in a different direction, then Allah knows. Innahu ya'lamu al-jahra wa ma yakhfa. He knows what you show. He knows the obvious and He knows what's hidden also. He knows both of them. He knows deep inside of ourselves if we made an effort to clean ourselves up. 
So this is something you and I have to ask ourselves in a very serious way. We have to engage in an interrogation of our own selves. We have to look deep inside ourselves to find the answer to this question. And may Allah make us of those who give preference to the Akhirah over this world. إِنَّ هَذَا لَفِي الصُّحُفِ الْأُولَى No doubt it is this that has truly been in the earliest scriptures. What has been in the earliest scriptures? That the, the next life is better and more lasting. What has been in the earliest scriptures? The very first thing the surah said, سَبِّحِ اسْمَ رَبِّكَ الْأَعْلَى Declare the greatness and acknowledge the perfection of the name of your Lord, the Most High. That declaration has been there in all of the scriptures. And at the end also, this simple lesson that the next life is better than this, if one internalizes that, they've got the gist of every messenger's message. Every messenger's message. And who, which two messengers have been mentioned? By the way, this inna hadha lafis suhuf al the earliest revelations are mentioned. And in a contrast, in the previous surah, which revelation was mentioned? This one, inna hu laqawlun fasl. This Quran is the decisive speech. Is decisive speech. Which two messengers are mentioned? Whose scriptures are mentioned at the end? Suhufi Ibrahim wa Musa. Now, why Suhuf Ibrahim wa Musa? What's the, what's the benefit of these two? Why not any of the others? Alayhim as Allahu Ta'ala A'lam, but the two primary audiences of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were the Mushrikun of Quraysh and the people of the book. The Mushrikun of Quraysh, which Prophet at least did they acknowledge? Ibrahim Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. The people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, their legacy begins with, with which Prophet? Musa Alayhi Salam. The, the, the concept of revelation begins with Musa Alayhi Salam. Even the Christians believe in the Old Testament, the one that was delivered to Musa alayhi salam. So the two audiences, the two primary audiences, their ears are tuned. He's not saying something new. He's the same thing your father Ibrahim said, and your leader, leader Musa said alayhi salam. It was the same exact message that's coming together here. This is the power of da'wah. And maybe that reminder will click with someone. Because remember, وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ فَعَتِ الذِّكْرَى Right? Remind. Perhaps reminder will have some benefit. If reminder serves to have some benefit, subhanAllah, that is how the surah ends. And once again, I conclude by saying the way the surah began, the surah began with something universal. And, and the surah ends by reminding us that same essential message. Two things in this surah, actually all three imaniyat, and this is one of the wisdoms of our Messenger, all three imaniyat are covered. All three imaniyat. The first part of iman is belief in Allah and His perfection. That's covered in the beginning of the surah. The second part of iman you could say is revelation. That's covered in the middle of the surah. When Allah tells him he will make him recite and he won't forget. That's risala. The third essential part of faith is the afterlife. That's covered at the end of the surah. Wal akhiratu khairun wa abqa. So iman billah, bil risala wa bil akhirah, all of them are covered in one surah. It's like a surah of all of iman summarized. A reminder of all of the aspects of our faith in very few words, just 19 ayat. May Allah Azza wa Jal give us the benefit of the reminder. May Allah help us memorize and, and recite the surah in our salawat in accordance with the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And may Allah help us and our families internalize its teachings. Barakallahu li wa lakum fi al-Qur'an al-Hakim. Wa nafa'ani wa iyyakum bil-ayat wa dhikr al-Hakim. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.